know, we're here. We made it to the last presentation of the day, and we're all tired and cranky, aren't we? <laughs> well, interestingly, we're not tired and cranky. That would make me cranky. But why is that? Because we've been sitting here for several hours. Now, of course, the Harlem Shake helped. Those cupcakes weren't bad, right? We had some breaks, we had a lunch. It's been a really nice time. But mostly, we're not tired and cranky right now because we've enjoyed listening to a lot of really incredible ideas. That's why we came here. That's why we're involved in the TEDx program. And that makes you unique. Don't uh, underestimate the power of what we just said. Because if you go out onto the streets of Hickory and just choose your average Joe and say, what are you going to do today? And all of us hang out. What are you going to do? I'm going to go sit for six hours and listen to people talk. <laughs> <laughs> Not very popular, is it? But you're unique in that way. All of us are. That's why we're here. So we're going to kind of circle around and talk about something that we talked about at the beginning. And that's about the fact that we kind of have a responsibility now. We know that with knowledge comes responsibility. We've gained a ton of knowledge today. So what are we going to do with it? It's something to think about, isn't it? What's our responsibility now? Well, I have at this point, oh my God, about 16 minutes to kind of wrap up my little present and hand it to you. And then it's going to be something for you to think about from there. So are you ready for my little present? Psst. Come here. Let me tell you something. Now we can't ignore that. We hear somebody say that we have to pay attention. If it's a good friend, we're going to stop whatever we're doing. And we're going to pay attention to whatever they have to say, even if it's just for a few moments to figure out it's not that big of a deal. If it's some creepy guy in the corner that says it, well, we can walk by. <laughs> But we're still not going to ignore it. You'll notice that in the back of your mind, your brain's still going to be saying, what did he want to tell me? What was so important? And even more interesting, you may find yourself spending the rest of the day coming up with more and more elaborate imaginings of what it might have been. Right? Maybe it was just, hey, buddy, I could use a dollar. Can you spot me? Or maybe, hey, man, your fly's down. I thought you wanted to know. But maybe it was, hello, my name is Enrico. I'm currently in possession of a key to a safe deposit box <laughs> that contains an ancient scroll and a diary and a very rare bead. <laughs> My doctor said I have 18 minutes to live, so I am trusting the key to you. Well, see, we could spend the rest of the day thinking about things like that because how awesome would that be if that was the story? But the point is, Stories are compelling to us. We have to absorb stories. We want to be entertained. We want to be taught. We want to be inspired by stories. To the point that we will drop whatever we're doing and pay close attention if we think we have the opportunity of hearing a good story. And we may even fill in the blanks when we don't get the story we want. You see, this is something that goes back thousands of years. We can even imagine our ancient ancestors sitting in a cave around a uh, smoldering fire, and they're watching the man that's up by the wall with a charred stick in his hand as he draws a crude picture of a running buffalo, and he regales them with the tale of his heroic efforts to bring this animal down and bring home the meat that they're enjoying for dinner. Now, logically, the family understands what Dad had to do to get the meat that they're eating, but they still love to hear him tell the story. And why? Because they weren't there when it happened, but they wanted to be. And he loves to tell the story. Why? Because they weren't there when it happened, but he wanted them to be. You see, he wanted to do more than just bring home the meat. He didn't want to just give them the end result. He wants to give them the journey that led to that destination. He wants to give them the story that led to that happy ending. And that's really what we're experiencing today as well. You and I have lives of our own, we have experiences of our own, and we feel a need to share those experiences with people who perhaps haven't had them yet. And equally, or even more importantly, we want to gain more experiences from others, because we know that in the 70 or 80 years we're not going to be able to experience absolutely everything. 
So we thrive on stories. A blank page, a blank page bothers us a lot, doesn't it? Whether literally, if you enjoy writing, or metaphorically, if you enjoy talking, we can't stand a blank page. Let me just give you an example. You've experienced it yourself in conversation. Somebody stops for a moment, they lose your thought, their thought, you want to fill it in for them. That's our tendency with stories. When we hear maybe what starts out as a good story, we want to continue it. If we run into a blank situation, we want to fill that blank. Because we don't want to waste our time with something that's not going to be inspirational, educational, or entertaining for us. That's something that we thrive on. It's really a basic human need. It's not something that's new to us. It's not something that's specific to a particular type of individual. It's everybody. Just like food, water, shelter, and companionship of other people, we really need stories in order to survive and in order to thrive. And that's one of the reasons, well, I should say, there are many different types of stories that we can enjoy. And we can enjoy, for instance, a spine-tingling thriller or a mystery. We can enjoy an action-packed adventure story, but what we really thrive on more than anything are stories of real people that are involved in real things, which is why reality TV is so incredibly popular. Now, you can have your own opinions on the positive or negative effect on the human culture of reality TV, but what it gives us the chance to do is to get in a steady diet of real people involved in extraordinary situations in which we can see ourselves. And just for that moment, we can actually imagine what it would be like if our lives were that interesting, right? But I'd like to submit that our lives really are that interesting. So we've established a few important points. One, as human beings, we love a good story. We're willing to put aside whatever we're doing and give it our full attention. Two, we love to tell a good story. It's something that we thrive on as well, sharing our experiences with others. And three, this is not something that's individual to us. This is something that is human nature. So the question now is, how are you going to tell your story? We're not all authors. We're not all poets. We can all read screenplays or do a number of other things that can get our story out there. Some of us can't even handle a Facebook update very well, can we? But you do have a story to tell. And because of human nature, your story is different from every other story being told. So when we're thinking about the individuality of stories, consider a grain of sand. Now looking from a distance, a grain of sand is hard to distinguish from all the other grains of sand. Earlier we heard about uh, snorkeling, I think it was Bruce snorkeling, and he was really close to the sand. He wouldn't be able to pick out an individual grain of sand. But let's just say this one right here, this is your grain of sand. Now, let's imagine that your grain of sand gets in the way of your friendly neighborhood oyster. And it gets stuck in his craw. You might say he can't get it off his mind. He keeps rolling it over and over again. He's thinking about it. He's polishing it up a little bit. And eventually, that little grain of sand that was indistinguishable from all the others is a beautiful pearl. Now, you have a unique perspective on the world that's completely different from the person sitting next to you. And it's quite possible that your unique worldview holds that shining gem of inspiration that that person's been unconsciously waiting for their entire life. That's something to think about. Your little grain of sand can do that much. But Paul Esther noted that stories only happen to those who are able to tell them. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we, as humans, tend to come up with a long laundry list of excuses as to why we can't tell our stories. And this is something that's been a theme today, hasn't it? We've talked about the things that hold us back from sharing our stories with people. 
So we're going to go over that again, and the reason is, as we know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, but repetition is the mother of retention. You can tweak that, I checked it, it's under 140 characters, go ahead. <laughs> so excuse number one, and this is probably the most popular excuse that stops fantastic things from happening. What if I'm boring? God forbid we bore anybody. It's really the, the germ of all stage fright, if you think about it. It's kind of ironic me talking about stage fright from up here. But what if we get up here and start telling our story, talking about who we are and what we do and why we're so passionate about it, and what we hear is crickets, or we hear laughing, or God forbid, snoring, or what if nobody shows up to listen? That's something that a lot of people can't get past, the possibility of boring somebody else. But Oscar Wilde had it right. You see, other people's business isn't boring. And you know this in your own experience as well. As long as a story is told in an interesting way, we tend to be interested in what's going on in other people's lives, right? Just think about this event as an example of that. See, you have just as much a right and probably deserve more to be on this stage right now as I do. These kind of events occur thousands of times over, all over the nation, all over the world, because people are inherently interested in other people's ideas. Do you need more examples? Well, turn on the uh, browser of your choice. You go to YouTube, go to Facebook, go to Twitter, any number of other social networking sites, and what we have are millions upon millions of people sharing their thoughts with the world. And Many of those millions of people have thousands, or in some cases even millions of followers, interested enough in what they have to say to pay attention to them. So yes, your story needs to be told, and don't worry about boring us. This is another one we heard earlier today, and it's absolutely true. We are currently in the midst of a complete information <coughs> overload. They say that every day, there's more information that's created and distributed than was available to all of humanity for the entire history of mankind up to the early 1700s. That's a little bit crazy, but it's also old news, and it's not an excuse. As was brought out earlier, Bruce mentioned that the human mind is extremely adaptable, and we have completely adapted to this information overload by becoming very selective with our attention. So, yes, if you're going to throw facts and figures at us that may have no relevance to our lives, chances are we are going to be able to ignore those. But, if you help us to feel something, if you strike an emotional chord with us, with your idea, your thought, your story, well then we pause. That bouncing mouse finger doesn't continue to bounce. Because now we know you have something to say that's important to us. You have something of value. You have a pearl. Now, if you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings movies or read the books, you know, as again was mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm doing a lot of repetition here. Not intentionally, that's just how it worked out. But hobbits are small creatures, right? But that didn't change the fact that they were able to save the world. Now, you and I are not necessarily involved directly in bringing about world peace or curing cancer. We're not necessarily going to be creating incredible works of art or saving starving children. But that doesn't mean that what we are doing, what we're passionate about, is of any less value to the people who are interested in it. If we imagine, for instance, walking on a sandy beach, as you're walking along you might be going slow, you might be going fast, you may go all over the beach, you may just go in one straight line, and each footprint that you leave behind you is a very small footprint. But you've changed the world nonetheless. The land you've walked on is different than it was before you got there. And if we look really close at your footprints, what's under there? Thousands of individual grains of sand that have all been changed because you decided to try that course. So don't underestimate the impact that your ideas and your actions can have <coughs> on others. You may just, again, change that person's view and help them to do the same for somebody else. But what if people think I'm weird? 
That's a serious excuse that people have. But you know what? If they think you're weird, all the better. Because the stranger and more off-kilter your worldview is, the more compelling your story becomes. The Inquirer figured that out decades ago, didn't they? Reality TV keeps it fresh today. Just turn on Jersey Shore. Right? We're compelled to watch things that are outside of our normal sphere, outside of our comfort zone. It's interesting to us. And it's a story that needs to be told. Which brings us to the crux of our conversation. Never laugh at live dragons. And you're saying, what? That's weird, right? Well, let me try to explain the segue a little bit by telling you a story of my own. Once upon a time, a young man left a small country village and decided that he wanted to seek his fame and fortune in the world as a dragon slayer. So he gathered up his few belongings, including a magical sword that his great-grandfather had given him named Firesong. He went off into the world seeking out dragons to slay. Well, one day he came across two dragons sunning themselves in a field, so he dropped his belongings, he picked out the fire song, unsheathed it, and let out a hearty hero's laugh. <laughs> and the dragons ate his face off and he died. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is don't tell stories like that one. Okay? As we heard earlier, the hero's quest is thousands of years old, and it still remains compelling today. Each one of us has the opportunity to live that story and to tell that story ourselves. But if you are marketing a business, tell us as a human being why we deserve your money. If you are applying for a job, tell us as a human being how you're going to fill that position perfectly. If you feel you have something of value to share with the world, tell us as a human being who you are, where, you're, where you've been, and where you're going. See, you don't necessarily need to slay dragons to hit that emotional cord with others that's necessary to make a compelling story. You don't need to laugh at dragons to be interesting. You just need to be you, and there is a story there, one that all of us want and need to hear. That's my present to you. Don't keep it to yourself.